we're ready to begin here. Thanks for coming and uh, appreciate you being here as this uh, class is being made up for discussion treaties. Um, this is uh, an opportunity to tar start to develop the way that uh, courts are approaching Section 35.1's framework for interpreting treaties. And uh, so last class we looked at the historical overview of treaties and tried to place them in their broader context. Um, sometimes you might wonder why we're not studying um, case law or statutory law more in depth here. Of course, we are studying case law. It is a part of every class, but it might not be like some other classes where all you do is have a steady diet of cases. We're always trying to set this in a broader context. Likewise, there's not a lot of statute to be able to guide this area. We saw the Indian Act is one of the few pieces that uh, has been enacted and it's an uh, old anachronistic uh, piece of legislation that doesn't have a lot of usefulness to First Nations uh, people today. Another reason we continue to look at context is because that's what this field requires. I'm gonna quote from a, a case from the Ontario courts in 1981 that's reproduced today in the Seeley case from the Supreme Court of Canada. The case is called Taylor and Williams, and it says this. Cases on Indian or Aboriginal rights can never be determined in a vacuum. It is of importance to consider the history and oral traditions of the tribes concerned and the surrounding circumstances at the time the treaty relied upon by both parties in determining the treaty's effect. And so this is why each class, not only in the treaty rights contracts, but in the Aboriginal rights context, we're always contextualizing um, because the court says you cannot work in this area of law without considering the history and the oral traditions of the tribe's concern and the surrounding circumstances at the time that the cases uh, go back to. Um, you cannot consider these issues in the abstract, and so that's why we continually work through the particulars of each case. Now today, uh, we are going to be looking at four cases though. The Paulette, White and Bob, Seeley and Badger case. Um, you've uh, read three of those cases, hopefully Paulette, Seeley and Badger, and I'm gonna give you a little bit of the background to White and Bob just to fill us in in this territory as well. You'll see the kind of questions that we're going to be asking of all of these cases are as follows. How do you interpret a treaty? and we'll understand that the court looks to what's called the canons of construction to appropriately interpret a treaty. These canons are giving the treaties a large, liberal, and generous perspective, looking at them as the Indians would naturally understand them, understanding them from the Indians' perspective, resolving an, any ambiguities in the document in favor of the Indians. And we'll look at the reasons for those canons, but that's a part of how you interpret the treaty. Um, secondly, we're going to ask questions about who can make a treaty. That is, what is the capacity of the parties in being able to negotiate this kind of an agreement? And we'll look at the capacity of the Indians, but we'll also consider the capacity of um, Great Britain and representatives sent out by Great Britain. Then we'll look at questions as to what are the, the uh, rights that are protected by the treaty. And one way of saying that, what is its geographic uh, scope? Um, how big is the boundaries in which the treaty right can be exercised? And then finally, what is the content of the treaty? What are the particular things that can be done within that boundary? Um, what counts as extinguishment? We know already from the Sparrow case to extinguish Aboriginal rights, you need clear and plain intent. And we're going to learn today that you also need clear and plain intent in order to find that a treaty right is extinguished. And then the final question is, how are treaty rights reconciled with other interests that might be held um, by the Crown? And we're um, going to find that some of that reconciliation actually takes place on the face of the document. Other parts of that reconciliation 
take place by understanding, again from that, uh, that Taylor and Williams case earlier, the uh, surrounding context of the time, the history, understanding the particularities of the um, uh, period in which the treaty was negotiated. And then we'll see um, in particular cases of Siwi and Badger that that reconciliation occurs by ensuring that um, there's not a visible incompatible use of land when Indians exercise their treaty rights. So those are the five questions we're going to be looking at in broad terms as we get into the details. I've also given you some answers to those questions already, but we'll try to understand more completely how it is the court arrives at those conclusions. Now, the first case that we're starting with today is this Paulette case, which comes out of the Northwest Territories. On the back there is uh, Mr. Paulette. And um, he was bringing an action in the late 60s, early 70s, to file a caveat on all land titles registered in the Northwest Territories. That caveat was to be that Aboriginal title still exists as an unextinguished interest throughout the Northwest Territories, and therefore every person who held a fee simple um, grant would hold that grant subject to Aboriginal title. And the question was, therefore, whether or not the treaty had extinguished Aboriginal title for the people in the Northwest Territories, whether or not Treaty 11 extinguished Aboriginal title amongst the Indians in the Northwest Territories. And the court came to the conclusion that there was a sufficient enough doubt to allow the case to be able to proceed um, such that they could argue a caveat could be issued. Um, there was a, this was an attempt to dismiss the fact that you could even deign to um, presume that a caveat could be issued. The court says there's enough information here that we're going to try this in more uh, detail. Now we should pause at this moment and think back to our discussion about the Chilcotin case. And what happens if there's an Aboriginal title interest within the Chilcotin territory that's not covered by a declaration of Aboriginal rights? Would it be possible for the Chilcotin to then bring another action, um, rather than trying to prove their claim as they did you know, for $40 million in five years, might they uh, bring a caveat on title? And uh, if that would be the case, um, you, know, you might have a different set of litigation issues that would arise. Um, what if that action was brought outside of the Chilcotin say a Shwetmik community or um, um, the Kitsan and the Wet'suwet'en, what if they chose to put, uh, launch an action for a caveat? In other words, saying that every person that owned a fee simple title, um, that land could be subject to Aboriginal interest. So this is what was being attempted here, and the court found that there was sufficient doubt in looking at what the treaty was saying about the title of the Aboriginal peoples there to allow an action to go forward. That, it is, that is, it is possible that it could have been the case that a caveat um, was issued. Now the courts, as this went through the higher levels, um, defeated the action uh, on other grounds. They never came back to this issue of a caveat. But we want to look at the reasons for decision why is it that the court came to the conclusion that Aboriginal title was likely not extinguished by Treaty 8? And then I want you to think about the implications of this decision for other treaty negotiations that we might consider. So, first of all, in this um, case, can a caveat regarding Indian interests and land be registered against a fee simple title interest? Yes. Um, depends on the legal effect of the treaty. The legal effect of the treaty here is to cause ambiguity around the extinguishment of title. So there's a lot of evidence regarding what the Indians thought was being asked of them in those treaty negotiations um, 
19, was it 1921? Yes, in 1921. And so you have this uh, Chief uh, Baptiste Kazan of the Fort Simpson Band, um, who testified that the lands in the area had all, always been theirs. According to him, for thousands of years, people used these lands for hunting and fishing. They roamed all over the country, and he regarded himself as the chief as being responsible for the proper exercise of that right throughout the territories. He says there's quite a few people today that are still living in accordance with that uh, way of life. And I've traveled through these territories. I know even today, there are a lot of people that still rely on hunting and fishing to supply the main portions of their diet and to be the main activity that they rely upon, economically speaking. So that was his evidence. They've always been there. And then Chief Arrowmaker from uh, Fort Ray um, talked about he was 12 years old at the time the treaty was signed. So as a young uh, teenager, he never heard people say that the land had been given up by the treaty. Then we have this Chief um, um, a Stuart, who also made the same point, never heard that it had been given up. Then there's this chief uh, Norwegian, um, who is um, uh, 64 years of age. He was present um, when the older chief uh, signed the treaty, Chief Norwegian, and uh, he observed that his grandfather, who was there at those negotiations, um, left the treaty negotiations. He wasn't satisfied with, was, with what was being um, promised by the government, and so he left and didn't even sign the treaty. And another person who wasn't the chief was appointed in his stead, um, this person named Antoine. Uh, they said, you know, this chief Norwegian here says, the white men made him, that is Antoine, the chief. And these promises um, were still about peace, about maybe getting a piece of grub steak, as the Indians um, and the commissioners led them to believe that would, they would get, the ability to be able to have some food from time to time. But this um, idea was, you know, Chief Norwegian didn't want to take any money for no reason at all. That's why he left. Chief Antoine steps in and says, well, even what I did, he's not the properly constituted authority, even what I did was just enter into a treaty of peace with the government. And then there's this chief, uh, Bonnerouge, who also says land was not mentioned at the treaty. Um, it was a deal to look after the people. So that's one part of the evidence, trying to understand this from the Indian's perspective. Then there are these orders in council that started occurring as early as 1891, repeated in 19, 1892, and then finally put into um, effect in 1921. And the order in council says it's advisable to enter into treaties with a view to extinguishing Indian title in such portions of the same that as it may be considered in the interest of the public to open up for settlement. So all this oral evidence doesn't talk a moment about settlement, but the instructions of the Crown's negotiators were, let's get this land um, dealt with so that we can um, um, extinguish the land. But then the Treaty 11 itself says this, um, actually the order in council which authorized the negotiation of Treaty 11. So this is still part of the instructions for the negotiation. I'm on the bottom of 321 there, 325, sorry. The early development of this territory is anticipated and it is advisable to follow the usual policy and obtain from the Indian cession of their Aboriginal title. So again, talking about extinguishment, but then a further fact is added here. And thereby bring them into closer relation with the government and establish securely their legal position. Part of the instructions were to create a relationship with the crown 
and also to protect the Indians in their possession of the land. So these different instructions um, don't seem to have been communicated to the Indians in terms of the first piece, extinguishment. The second piece seems to be what the Indians remember, having a closer relationship with the government, having their lands be protected by the government. So in light of this conflicting evidence on the one side, everything we hear from the Indians, on the other side, that extinguishment provision, the court's left with two plausible interpretations about what occurred in 1921. One interpretation is that perhaps the government just confirmed its own paramount title, right? That idea of the underlying title of the crown is maybe all that it confirmed. And the second interpretation is that there was a failure of the minds of the parties to meet. Therefore, there was no agreement. Treaty 11 did nothing to deal with land. Maybe it even did nothing in relationship to securing other political and social rights that the Crown wanted in that territory. So the court looks at uh, those issues and asks, you know, this question, what does this case say about the failure to have the text of the treaty, which says, you can read that on 326, that the chiefs or the Indians do hereby cede, release, surrender, and yield up? And so what does that document on the one hand, how is that reconciled with this tradition at the time of the treaty that they were never asked to or considered to cede, release, surrender, or yield up. Um, you could say, as per that first interpretation on the last slide, that all it did was confirm the crown's underlying title. But you could even ask, did it even do that? It doesn't seem like there was a lot of discussion about where the crown would have got this title from in the first place. It seems as though, as the court says here, it did not terminate Aboriginal rights there was um, largely no meeting of the minds. We talked about the Indian feelings at the treaty. They were scared uh, that they were being asked to do something um, that they weren't in agreement with. They were scared that their words were being twisted and that the interpretations that they were being given weren't in accord with their understanding. They were su suspicious. They felt like they were being manipulated. And uh, some of the officials that stood on side, in terms of the, um, maybe not the officials, some of the observers at site, um, the missionaries, the traders, when they wrote back to Ottawa about what was going on there, they confirmed this suspicion, uh, this manipulation that the Indians thought that they were under there. Did the government interfere with these groups? It does seem to be the case, uh, with Antoine being chosen over old Norwegian. And there were also fairly large segments of the population that weren't present at the time the treaty was negotiated. And it felt to some as if an ultimatum was being given rather than a true negotiation occurring. And the treaty text was misleading in relationship to, it was never really felt that these people would pick up farming that they would continue to hunt and, uh, and fish, and there was, there was worry about this idea of the surrender. So the result is that at least you can go to trial to figure out um, whether or not a caveat can be properly registered against individuals in simple title throughout that territory. So this tells you a little bit about what might have occurred in other treaties. I stress what might have occurred. I'm gonna go back to this Taylor and Williams quote. Cases on Indian and Aboriginal rights can never be determined in a vacuum or even in the abstract. It is important to consider the history and oral traditions of the tribes concerned and the surrounding circumstance at the time of the treaty relied upon to determine the treaty's effects. This Treaty 11 negotiation um, might not have been what occurred in Treaty 4, or Treaty 1, or the Robinson-Huron, or the Peace and, Peace and Friendship Treaties. Although it does raise a suspicion. Even though you can't say that every treaty that has been signed 
has been subject to manipulation. Here we are in 1921, very late in the day when treaties are being signed and there's still um, um, tactics being used that seem to be contrary to the honor of the crown. Yes? British government policy regarding like kind of like a standard kind of technique or whether at school the, for these kind of officers they were teaching them to kind of negotiate these ways? Yeah, so the question is has there ever been any research done about the standard way of proceeding, the kinds of instructions that the treaty negotiators would get? There has been. In fact, one of the prime books that just came out last year is by Professor Michael Ash, who teaches in the Department of Anthropology here. He's looked at uh, Treaty 4 and has written this book with the University of Toronto Press called On Being Here to Stay. And he does talk about the mixed messages that often get shared by the Crown. Um, but he also says there was honor present on occasion, particularly in Treaty 4, in understanding uh, what the responsibilities of the government officials were to be. Uh, Sir William Johnson, who was the lead official for Indian Affairs um, at the time, Britain started exercising its influence in Canada uh, after the Royal Proclamation, was also another person that had a lot of honor, it seems, in the way that that role was undertaken. Um, I'm not so sure about this, right? This doesn't seem to be honorable in the way that we have in these other negotiations. But you can studies of that kind of nature. There's all sorts of questions you can think about. Uh, you know, perhaps there's no treaty because there's no meeting of the minds in this case. What if you get a meeting of the minds, but then the treaty starts to be implemented and it's not in accordance with the wishes of the Indians or the Crown? Is there a point in which you can say there's a fundamental breach in the treaty such that it should be set aside and you return back to the Aboriginal title status of the initial arrangement. I, I guess that goes, I mean, that's a question of interpretation. So if you were just doing a sort of common law contractual approach to this agreement, yes. and you have all of those remedies, which would be either there was actually no contract in the first place, or there's breach, so there's various things to do. But are you interpreting this using both systems? And so what would be the, the remedy in the indigenous system for breaching the agreement? So this is a great point. Uh, response to maybe this being a fundamental breach is to be cautious about using contract law to determine whether or not this agreement is at an end. Because we've lo learned already that we can look to the common law by way of analogy, but it's not determinative. Um, and so we therefore also need to look at the indigenous perspective on whether or not that treaty has been terminated and find out what their law might be in regard to um, failure to fulfill the promises and the obligations that are part of that agreement. And the research that I did over a period of three years working with the treaty elders of Saskatchewan was that they couldn't set it aside on conditions of a fundamental breach because they didn't just make the agreement with the Crown, its representatives. The agreement was made using the pipe, using their medicine bundles. And so when they finished the agreement, they held it up to the sky and they regarded themselves you know, as actually making a covenant with the creator to live in accordance with the promises that they made. And you, in that legal system, cannot break a covenant with the creator. Now they were also encouraged in that belief in relationship to it being a covenant with the Creator, because at many of these treaty sessions, the priests and the missionaries were there. Sometimes they were the translators. And in translating to the Indians what was expected, they would use the religious language that they were trying to teach them in one breath and fold that across in the way that they were talking about what their obligations might be with the crown there. So with the missionaries being present there, with the religious language being present there, it appeared to them too that the crown was also making a covenant with the creator in setting up the treaties on the Sarah 
that's right. So it's a great question about what is the effect of interpretation on understanding the treaty and whether or not interpretation got better as time went on. Um, not always. Uh, sometimes you had the parties searching around for a proper interpreter. In the Treaty 6 negotiations, the Crown thought they had appointed someone who was competent and capable. They started negotiating and the Indians said, we do not want this person here. They're not understanding the way we're talking. So they hired their own interpreter. And so you had kind of competing interpreters for a while in that negotiation. In other negotiations, it was a similar kind of fiasco. But then the question is, even if you did get good interpretation, is it possible to translate across the meaning of things? If, if the earth is living in uh, many of these Cree, uh, Algonquian-speaking Ojibwe-type languages, and you talk about the seed release and surrender of land, how can you sell your mother, right? How can you really find that translation properly so that there is a meeting of the minds after that fashion? Having said that, sometimes I think we, and I agree with a lot of that, sometimes you can't get good translation. Having said that, languages itself are amazing technology that even if you can't get exact uh, meaning, you can get very close to what it is the person is trying to say on the other side. You often hear some Indian people saying, we had no such word as self-government, or no such word as treaty, or no such word as et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Perhaps on the face of it. Um, but most languages have uh, the ability um, to be able to uh, further develop um, in encountering new um, structures. So this is an example that my daughter Lindsay shared with me when she was learning the language um, about um, describing something like blueberry pie. Um, obviously there was no pies amongst the Ojibwe prior to the arrival of Europeans. And so what do you call this thing? Well, first of all, you don't call it a thing. You don't call it a noun. You don't categorize. You make it a verb is the first difference. So imagine trying to describe blueberry pie not by its nounness, you know, not by its fixity, but by what it would look like as an action item to be able to understand blueberry pie. And here's the word. Uh, no. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> it just goes on and on and on. It's so long. It actually has that German type of feature where you add suffixes and prefixes and you can just keep uh, um, um, inflecting the word as you develop it. So, chigiate, old time, way uh, metagoshi, stick labor. That's what they call the French people because they would come with a cross, right? <laughs> and they would wave that for absolution. <laughs> so the old time stick wave, but chigiat wave and agoshi, minaboshke, bursting berries, uh, minosagane, um, sauce that then occurs after that burst thing, vito uh, sijigani, layering it uh, between things, jegwa pikanagani, bending over uh, and putting it in the oven, bakwejigan, uh, bread. So the word is a description of how the thing is made, rather than saying, you know, this is a thing. And so when you're in treaty negotiations, imagine the difficulty, right? First of all, English wants to talk about nouns, Algonquian languages want to talk about verbs, and then you have to start making up things, right? There's no such word as blueberry pie, or there's no such word as seed, release, and surrender. So how do you get that done? This is part of that, right? Chigiate and Dagoshi, Minabashki, Minasagani, Vito, Sajigani, Jekwapi, Kangani, Kwasia. It gives you a sense of what we're involved here in trying to do as we uh, involve ourselves in treaty negotiations. So we can keep moving with this issue to the next uh, time era, which is the White and Bob case. Um, this case has to do with uh, the Nanaimo uh, First Nation in the mid 60s. Um, the people of the Nanaimo First Nation felt that they had a treaty with Governor Douglas that allowed them to be able to hunt and fish as formerly throughout their territories. The representatives of the Crown did not think 
there was any such agreement. And in fact, when Indians would try to exercise their rights under that agreement, they would be prosecuted under the Provincial uh, Game Act. And with this prosecution, Indians started going further and further into the bush to try to take deer, take fish in their territory. And so then sophisticated sting operations started to develop to try to entrap or catch the Indians in the process of this uh, activity. And the question is whether or not the Nanaimo people had a treaty. And if they did have a treaty, whether or not the treaty would be paramount to the provincial legislation. Now, there's a couple of pieces of wording that we need to get through here. First of all, what is the document that the Nanaimo rely upon? It's reproduced on the top of page 330. Here's the clause. The condition of or understanding of this sale, this is Governor Douglas's uh, language, is that our village sites and enclosed fields are to be kept for our own use and for the use of our children and for the use of those who may follow after us. And the land shall be properly surveyed hereafter. So they're enclosed fields, lands that um, they have for their village sites are protected to them, reserved to the Indians. It is understood, however, that the land itself, with these small exceptions, becomes the entire property of the white people forever. There's a question about whether or not that's the way the Indians understood it. We'll get to that in a moment. But then, it is also understood that we are at liberty to hunt over the unoccupied lands and to carry on our fisheries as formerly. So this is what they're saying they have the right to do, is to be able to hunt on unoccupied lands. Now why would it be that the provincial game law wouldn't apply in the face of this treaty in 1965, before we had Aboriginal treaty rights constitutionalized, right? In that time, you would just think that the legislatures and parliament were supreme. Well, here's why the Indians said that the treaty prevailed over the statute. And it's the next section of uh, text here on page 330, which is section 87 of the Indian Act. It's now section 88 of the Indian Act. But here's how it starts. Subject to the terms of any treaty, all laws of general application from time to time in force of the province are applicable to and in respect of Indians in the province. So all laws of general application that the province passes apply to Indians, is what section 88 says, section 87 says, subject to the terms of any treaty. So they're saying those laws of general application, the Provincial Game Act, do not apply to them because the treaty um, is overriding. Parliament has made its wishes known that the treaty should be paramount to the statutory provision. Now we're going to look at federalism in this section in particular in more detail a couple of weeks from now when we look at the case called Queen versus Vic. But at this moment uh, we find um, that the court comes to the conclusion that this is a treaty. The Douglas Agreement is a treaty and therefore the Indians have the right to hunt on that unoccupied lands formally, and therefore the Provincial Game Act does not apply. But to come to that conclusion, the court has to ask, what is a treaty? And how would you determine what a treaty is meant, a treaty means? And the court uh, says um, a treaty has to be understood as the Indians would understand it. Uh, a treaty, um, has to be given a generous interpretation to embrace all such engagements that were made by persons in authority with the Indians where these promises were held out. This upholds the sanctity of uh, the British Crown, um, the court says. Now just to look at that treaty for a second, this same treaty the wording is the treaty language that also took place with 11 treaties here around Victoria, 
and two treaties on the north of Vancouver Island. When settlers arrived on Vancouver Island, there was over um, um, 33,000 Aboriginal peoples living on Vancouver Island. That number fell dramatically, such that when the treaties were signed, um, you find that there's, um, they, they're meeting with hundreds of people rather than uh, thousands of people. Um, so there are very few people engaged in the treaty negotiating process. Um, but here's a map of the um, Victoria treaties, the Douglas treaties around Victoria. Suit and Beecher Bay and Esquimalt and um, this Gordon Head area, downtown, um, no Bay area, very small areas of land. Now the main site for the um, Kungan, the Saanich uh, speaking peoples and their villages was right here. And um, right down the bottom of Cadborough Bay. And when Douglas arrived, they moved their villages to Fort Victoria in that area. Douglas says, we sailed up to uh, Fort, what would become Victoria, it was just a, a dense um, uh, dark bush with open spaces with big giant oak meadows, with the very oak uh, head. When Douglas uh, wanted to build that fort, he received instructions. He asked what he should do of the um, his, his his superiors, and they said you should enter into a treaty. Um, you should um, you know, purchase the land from them. And so this is what he regarded that he was doing. Um, but when the actual negotiations took place, what often occurred is sometimes it was just a blank piece of paper, and. In, so, so here's an example, here's a piece of paper. And what happened was, as it was reported, if the Indians um, gave their consent, so they give consent, the Indians marked their names. You notice how all those X's are in the same handwriting? <laughs> and all the writing there to the um, side of those X's is also in the same. One wonders if even they marked the page. But then what happened is once those marks would occur, Douglas searched around for what the text should be in relationship to this agreement he had entered into. And the text of the Douglas Treaties was actually found uh, from New Zealand. You know, the British experience in that part of the world was drawn upon and that was subsequently inserted. So you even wonder what this agreement in terms of the text means for the Indians when you know, <laughs> you've got this kind of um, uh, explanation going on. Be that as it may, um, we do have a confirmation that the Douglas Treaty peoples here have the right to hunt and fish as formerly on all unoccupied lands. This is really significant. In 1987, there was a proposal to build a marina in Sandston Bay. And the Indians didn't like that um, proposal because they thought it would interfere with their fishery. Because in constructing the marina, you would get the eelgrass being dredged up. And dredging up the eelgrass would mean you wouldn't have the crab there. Would it influence negatively the you know, mollusks that they might take? And then you might not get the same fisheries also going in there. So in that case, the court held that you couldn't dredge the bay for the purpose of constructing the marina um, because that would infringe, negate, extinguish the right to fish as formerly in that area. So it's an interesting um, decision because it tells us that we might not just be protecting the fish or the animals, but also the habitat in which the fish and the animals obviously reside. And so, environmentally speaking, treaties might be important to sustainability within territories, because if those rights are taken seriously, like in the Sanchez Marina case, then that means that we need to have a healthy ecosystem under which 
other uses can occur. And of course, there is the question as to whether or not the Indians really thought that they were even extinguishing their land here and giving it over to the Hudson's Bay Company, subsequently being taken by the Crown. And right at Vancouver Island, that was the colony for a while, right? Vancouver Island was its own colony for a while, and then it was joined with the colony of British Columbia when it was before it became a province, and of course after it became a province. But the point of this case is to contrast it with the Syllaboy case that we looked at last class. Now we're looking at treaties as the Indians would understand it. And we're starting to think about the honor of the crown, the sanctity of the crown, as they say here, in interpreting these agreements. Which brings us then to um, one of the big cases that uh, we read in preparation for today, which is the Seely case. So um, the Seely uh, case uh, flows out of Wendat, or Huron history. We've already talked a little bit about the Hurons in the past. The Hurons, the Wendat, are the people that lived initially where Aurelia, Collingwood, um, Barry is around Lake Sim between Lake Simcoe and Georgian Bay. And you might remember there's about 40,000 people near Huron, Wendat, that lived there between 1615 and 1650. Why aren't they living there anymore? Partially because of the diseases that wiped out a big portion of their population, uh, partially because of the war that they had with the Haudenosaunee people, which ended up scattering them. Um, in that scattering, which you can again read about in the Arenda, that book uh, that was written by uh, Joseph Boyden, uh, one of these groups made their way to what is now Quebec. They eventually um, were able to have a reserve uh, north of Quebec City. It's called the Lorette uh, Huron, Lorette Wendat Reserve. There are actually three other Wendat communities. One's in Oklahoma, one's in Kansas, and one's in Michigan. So they've really been uh, scattered for sure but they do have a confederacy between the four nations in any event. Well, these people living in Quebec, um, four of the Siwi uh, family, wanted to use this beautiful park that you see uh, here in the background, the Jacques Cartier Park. They wanted to use it for teaching, they wanted to use it for traditional activities, and so what they did is they cut some um, wood for the purposes, I think, of shelter, making fires in, in this park. I looked at the park website today. It's rainy, it's cold, it's about five degrees, right? So I could see why you might wanna make uh, use of a fire if you're trying to use this park at certain seasons. And in cutting this wood, it was alleged that this was contrary to the Parks Act regulations, Quebec Park Act regulations, that said you cannot destroy, mutilate, or remove any plants in a park, and that camping and fires are permitted only in designated spaces. This was not a designated space, and therefore the Siwi Brothers activity here, the Wendat activity, uh, should be subject to a fine of not less than $50, not more than $1,000. So they are subject to a fine for building a fire in this park. But they say, wait a second, this provincial act should not apply to us. These regulations should not apply to us because we have a treaty with the Crown that stems from 1760, that guarantees our rights to religious freedom. And in this park, we are practicing through teaching, through ceremony, 
our own um, spiritual ways. And so the question becomes whether or not this thing that the when that claim the text there rights to religious freedom is a treaty. And then secondly, if the court does find it to be a treaty, whether or not it can prevail over the provincial act. Again, we're not considering section 35 explicitly at this point. Although the test that we're going to see laid out here is going to be the one that when we start to deal with section 35 one um, kind of carries the day. So that those are the facts. Um, the decision is that this they do have a treaty from 1760 that guarantees them the right to religious freedom, and therefore the provincial act does not apply. They're they're not fined here. So does that make sense that I see that between between the all the um, the presumptive state that they want to exercise their discretion to say is there is or is there a situation in which they could the court could find yes this is a treaty but it doesn't uh, or a provincial right to exercise religion proves yes. So the last uh, about page and a half of the decision uh, examined that second question as to whether or not the treaty prevails over the statute. And the court gives us some analysis about reconciling the statute with the treaty. And uh, they use some language about visible and compatible use, saying, you know, in the park, it's open for everyone. And there really is no general restriction on use, you know, subject to you know, some regulations there. And it's not going to harm anyone if the, the Wendat people practice their ceremonies here. That fulfills the purposes of the Park Act. And so in, that, in this case, there's not much work that's done under that second part of the text. Uh, but in future uh, cases, um, it's not just about whether or not there is a treaty. It's also then talking, what is the scope and the content of the treaty? And if you read the scope narrow enough, or the content narrow enough, um, then it may be the case that the Indians don't have the right to be able to practice what they claim, despite a treaty uh, being in place. So that is a good, good question. Okay, so we know the facts, the issue, the decision. Um, now we're gonna break this out into uh, sub-issues. First thing the court has to decide is how are they going to interpret the treaty? And this is where we're introduced more explicitly and actually for the first time to what's called the canons of construction. And the court says in the middle of page 351 that statutes, actually treaties and statutes, note that part, treaties and statutes relating to Indians should be liberally construed and uncertainty is resolved in the favor of the Indians. So here, you know, he's construing the Park Act liberally in favor of the Indians, but it could be the British Columbia Corporations Act, it could be the Education Act, it could be the Child Welfare Act. These things are to be construed liberally in favor of Indians, even when you're not in a treaty context. But treaties as well, it says treaties and statutes are to be construed this way, giving adopting a broad and a generous interpretation of what constitutes a treaty, also a generous interpretation of who has the capacity to enter into treaties. They're to be, be given a liberal construction. And then they quote from this case from the United States Supreme Court in 1899, justifying the reasons for this position. Um, and I'm just going to read from that decision on the bottom of page 351. In construing any treaty between the United States and the Indian tribe, it must always be borne in mind that the negotiations for the treaty are conducted, that is, on the part of the United States by an enlightened and powerful nation, by representatives skilled in diplomacy, masters of a written language, understanding the modes and forms of creating 
the various technical estates known to their law and assisted by an interpreter employed by themselves and that the treaty is drawn up by them and in their own language. So on the one hand, all of these things that the government does. On the other hand, the Indians are weak and dependent people who have no written language and are wholly unfamiliar with the forms of legal expression and his only knowledge of the terms in which the treaty is framed is that imparted to them by interpreters employed by the United States. And the treaty therefore must be construed over the page, not according to the technical meaning of its words to learned lawyers, but in the sense they would naturally be understood by the Indians. So there's a lot that's important and powerful and good for First Nations, the Eti Inuit, as they enter into trees here in trying to interpret things like the Douglas Treaty or Treaty 11, right? Because we know that you can't interpret it just in accordance with its Western formulations. And in fact, uh, they have to be understood as the Indians would understand them. Then there's some language that's not so kind there, right? In terms of the viewing of Indians as being uh, weak in the way that uh, they formed their culture and entered into these kinds of negotiated arrangements. I know this is sort of slipping back into the potentially dangerous contract context, but would you think that it's useful to think of the Treaty 99 now as the Council of Lawrence and not the Council of Lawrence? Yeah. So you have, you have to ask yourself the question here, rightly so. Is there some kind of unconscionability that's here that could void a treaty? Is the duress a ransom-like uh, provisions here that could um, void a treaty because there's no meeting of the minds. Um, now, that's possible. Contract law is helpful by way of analogy. It's just that it's not determinative. And so we also have to get the Indian understanding of not only the terms of the treaty, but what the remedies might be, the enforceability provisions might be to get there. That's a good question and comment. Other things to say about this language? Let me give you a hypothetical. Say the um, Shwetmik people, uh, or say the Kamloops Indian Band, they haven't entered into a treaty, they're in the interior of British Columbia, they negotiate a treaty today. They sign it this afternoon. They have a dispute tomorrow about what the terms of the treaty mean. Should this justification be used for interpreting the treaty? Should we be using canons of construction in interpreting modern treaties in light of what is said here? Should we? Yeah? Well, I think that we kind of, it kind of depends on the situation. So say if the Inuit people had like Woodward and Co, <laughs> and they were like very sophisticated, then probably a lot less. Okay. So if the party has representation by good lawyers and they do it in English and most of the Kamloops people um, that are negotiating are also speaking in English, there'd be a lot less reason for applying the canons of construction and interpreting them in this large, liberal, and generous way on behalf of, uh, in favor of the Indians, resolving ambiguity and doubt in their favor. Can you think of another interpretation that comes from the other direction as to why you still might want these canons? Yes. It's hard to think about similarly in treaties and, and say that, okay, well, this time around, if you have lawyers, you understand the language. And so we're going to seek to enforce this supposed essentially text in a way that we're clear to say the court can just not apply it this time because he probably knew what was going on. And so that, that to me, also feels. Paternalistic. Yeah. So it could still be paternalistic uh, to say that, well, we're going to interpret it without that because you guys now are sophisticated. There's something about that that almost implies like you wouldn't otherwise be if you didn't have lawyers and you, didn't, you weren't speaking English. So that could be a challenge. It might also be that the power imbalance. 
this is good, right? It may be that we would still apply the canons of construction with lawyers, it's all done in English, because we're also concerned about another kind of imbalance of power between crown and uh, first nations. Now that is a live issue as to how that is going to be resolved. It seems as though the court was coming down on the side of we don't need the canons of construction anymore. If the Indians have lawyers and speak English, um, the court doesn't seem to bring out the remaining power imbalances that are there that might still want you to see those canons of construction applied. The reason I had that, uh, have you do that little bit of analysis though, is because I wanted you to think about the reasons for the canons. And is it is it just the difference in their cultures and language? Or is there something about the difference in the way they're situated to one another that would also give rise to the need for this kind of interpretive tool? Yes? It seems like there's a, this, this liberal the canons of construction idea needs to go part and parcel with, I guess, what we get in Belvedere, which is, in the Supreme Court decision Belvedere, which is evidentiary issues need to be broadened. Because how could you really prove it's difficult to prove, say, in an early 20th century treaty, how the Indians understood that treaty yeah. if you don't expand what's evidence of that understanding. That's right. How could you even get to proof, is the comment here, unless you expand the understanding of evidence itself? And these canons of construction are like Delmuk in that they expand um, what can be considered, as we'll see in a few moments. And then even as we're interpreting different things that we might not otherwise consider, we're construing them in a way that tries to give benefit to a party that wasn't negotiated in English, didn't have legal representation, and also felt an imbalance of power in that way. So it's nice, you did a good job there of drawing a link between the Delton uh, formulation of generosity in relationship to evidence without straining the constitutional structure, they say. Likewise here, uh, generosity in finding evidence about whether or not there's a treaty, whether or not there's capacity to enter into a treaty, these canons are useful in that regard. So then the court will, with that um, canon in mind, start to interpret what the capacities of the parties are. And first of all, they look at the capacities of Great Britain, and the argument was, uh, Great Britain had no right to enter into a treaty here that they would consider enforceable because at the time the French government was the European authority that had responsibility uh, for where the Huron were um, living. So, so Great Britain has no authority, the argument is, because they had no land in this part of North America. And the court rejects that and says, well, the Wendat people would have been smart enough to know that if the English didn't prevail, the terms of the treaty they entered into with them wouldn't have been enforceable. But they would have also known that if the French would be defeated, which looked like it was imminent, at that point the French would no longer be the authority there, and uh, therefore the British um, party would be the one that had this capacity. So Britain doesn't even need to have sovereignty in this territory at the time the treaty was entered into to uh, create a set of enforceable obligations because we're looking at this from the perspective of the Indians. Um, would you say that that um, would help to uh, what you were saying about the Yes, in fact, this case really builds up when that and First Nation sovereignty and says these people were part of this, were the, treated equivalently and equally to the kinds of sovereignty that Britain and um, France were most familiar with. So we're looking at questions of sovereignty here, um, not just from the perspective of the crown, because that both in France and Great Britain, but also sovereignty from a First Nations perspective. 
Um, General Murray, the Crown argued, did not have capacity to enter into this agreement because he was the fourth official down the list um, in terms of seniority in this part of British North America. And the court uh, does not accept that argument that he doesn't have capacity. They find that he does have capacity. Uh, first of all, um, he was the governor of uh, the city and the District of Quebec and the Brigadier General of that army at the time the conflict was going on. And uh, had the power to set you know, rates or currency in the city, etc. He also, the court says, would have been understood by the Indians as having this authority. From the Indians' point of view, from their perception, he had capacity to enter into the treaty. Therefore, Governor Murray had actual authority from the British perspective. He also had authority from the perception of the Indians. They, the Indians could have reasonably assumed he had this capacity. And then third, the Indians, the Huron here, have this capacity. The Crown said they can't enter into a treaty here. This is not their traditional territory. They're from hundreds of miles away in their homelands, which was back between Georgian Bay and Lake Simcoe. Treaties can't be entered into unless you're living on your homelands. The Crown refutes that argument and says the Huron's capacity doesn't depend on whether or not they're in their traditional grounds. In other words, treaties can be about more than just land or based on where people come from with their land. The court actually explicitly says they can be about um, political rights, they can be about social rights. So they have the capacity to enter into this treaty even though it's not their traditional territory. All three have the capacity, and you'll note how we use the canons of construction to be able to get to that conclusion. Now, is this a treaty? The wording of the treaty is as follows. wording of the treaty promises them, let's see, here we go, bottom of page 356. These are to certify that, and that's just the first sentence, maybe if I have to go back to the beginning of the, yeah, here we go, I have to go back to the beginning of the judgment, 350. These are to certify that the chief of the Huron tribe of Indians having come to me in the name of his nation to submit to his Britannic majesty and make peace, has been received under my protection with his whole tribe. And henceforth, no English officer or party is to molest or interrupt them in returning to their settlement at Lorette. And they are to be received upon the same terms with the Canadians, being allowed the free exercise of their religion, their customs and liberty of trading with the English recommending it to the officers commanding the post to treat them kindly. So, the Crown says, this isn't a treaty. This is just a one-time event to certify that they can travel back home off the battlefield and not be molested and disturbed. Um, the Crown also says that the wording um, is only a personal undertaking on the part of Governor Murray not binding on other parties, that um, there's no formalities as a part of this either, therefore it's not a treaty. The court says we can't just look at the wording alone. Right? We already know that from the Jones and Meehan case. We've now seen this from the White and Bob case and the Hallett case, that what you have to do is um, Look at the wording in its broader context. And so what the court does is take in extrinsic evidence to understand the wording of the treaty. And part of this evidence um, 
part of this evidence is what was occurring prior to the treaty is one part. What occurred contemporaneously with the treaty, at the time of the treaty, and what the subsequent conduct of the parties were after the treaty. And the court says when you look at extrinsic evidence before the treaty, it goes to the point that you were raising, that the Indians here were exercising great power in North America. Um, I'm just going to read some of these quotes. In the middle of 360, the Indian nations had sufficient independence and played a large enough role in North America for it to be, to be good policy to maintain relations with them very close to those maintained between sovereign nations. Um, they were regarded in their relations with the European nations, next paragraph, as independent nations. Um, demonstrates the recognition of by Great Britain that nation-to-nation -nation relations had to be conducted between the North American Indian tribes and themselves. The control of North America could not be acquired without Indian cooperation. Um, in other words, and it talks about autonomy in another part here, uses that word very clearly. When the French surrendered to the English on the Plains of Abraham, they had no authority to surrender for the Indians. The Indians were a separate people from the French. And so any capitulation document that the French entered into that might have had some similarity to the Huron document here is not to be read in that same light. They, in fact, the court says it wasn't a capitulation document. Um, it recognized um, that the British Crown was going to have to continue to try to secure their cooperation. They defeated the French at the Plains of Abraham. They did not defeat the Indians. Therefore, the treaty, in its historical context, um, had that background. And then, then contemporaneously, General Murray was under a lot of pressure at the time the treaty was transacted. His troops were still crossing the river at Montreal. He had to march there himself. It was a few days after that they exchanged wampum belts. And in exchange of wampum belts, there was a solemnity indicating this is more than just a personal pledge on the part of General Murray. This was something that represents the crown and their relationships with the Indians. And then finally, subsequent conduct, um, like the uh, record afterwards also shows that it could be considered a treaty. We lost our PowerPoint here. Extinguishment, the Crown next says, well, maybe it's a treaty, but certainly that was extinguished. Uh, the court's answer to that question is, extinguishment has to be clear and plain. And nowhere in that document I read to you, does it talk about them extinguishing their rights? The Treaty of Paris, which put an end to the conflict between French and Britain, didn't extinguish Indian rights. The Royal Proclamation didn't extinguish their rights, in fact, recognized Indian rights. The legislative history is silent on this treaty, but the court says the failure to use the treaty in a legislative sense does not amount to its extinguishment. Silence, again, cannot be extinguishment. And then the last point in the judgment is the one that we asked and talked about a little bit earlier, um, which is the purpose of the Park Act allows for public access. And as long as the Wendat here are not disturbing other park users, they can exercise their treaty right in this territory content of the right must be reconciled with what the crown wants to do with that land as well. And you're going to see that same conclusion is going to hold in the Badger case, which I'm going to talk about just in a moment, but I want to just put this hypothetical before you. So they're, you know, burning a fire, having some ceremonies. Here, no issue of it being irreconcilable. But the 
With that, people used to have something, and maybe still do have something called the Feast of the Dead, where they used to disinter the bones of their ancestors and other nations that they came into contact with after a certain period, and they'd rebury them with the idea that their friends and enemies would mingle together with one another and be happy in the next life. And a black dog or a dog was usually sacrificed to seal that ceremony. So they go into the Jacques Cartier Park, and now they're not just burning fires, but they slay a dog. Would it be the case that the court would have found that there's a reconcilable use here? The court doesn't answer that question. I don't know if you have a sense of that. On one read of what the court says, it should be permissible. Um, we're trying to get at the common intent of the parties here, giving full effect to the spirit of conciliation. There needs to be necessary flexibility. You can't prejudice the Huron's interests. But the Crown did want to secure its use of those territories as well, so the Hurons would have understood that they couldn't go into someone's backyard and cut down trees. Right? So they, their, the geographic scope of their right to exercise treaty doesn't go into someone's backyard, but does it extend to a public place where they might be doing something that's not against the law here uh, formally, but might not be regarded as so reconcilable as an Indian is burning the village. I don't think there's an answer to that question at this moment, but I think you can speculate with me uh, given some of the debate that's occurring this election around people with differences and the way they present themselves with citizenship ceremonies and what's reconcilable in living together in a country with one another. Um, maybe the fire qualifies, but you'd have a more difficult time with the dog. And of course, all the other statutes would kick in at this point and be part of figuring out reconciliation. Which brings us to the last case, which is the Badger case. So now we're on the prairies, and we're in, um, actually even into the woodlands of northern Alberta, northern British Columbia, northern Saskatchewan, and southern parts of Northwest Territory. Treaty 8 gives the Indians the right to uh, be able to hunt. But the question is, can the Indians hunt on private land? So here's the clause, paragraph, uh, page 372. And Her Majesty, the Queen, hereby agrees with the said Indians that they shall have the right to pursue their usual vocations of hunting trapping and fishing throughout the track surrendered as heretofore described subject to such regulations as may from time to time be made by the government of the country acting under the authority of her majesty and saving and accepting such tracks as may be required or taken up from time to time for settlement mining lumbering trading or other purposes. So what, what's that saying? Indians have the right to hunt in their traditional territories that are subject to the treaties, unless the lands are taken up for, hunt, for mining, lumber, farming, uh, trading, or other purposes. Now, these three were hunting. One was hunting in a, a swamp, there was no visible sign of any kind of settlement around him. One was hunting where there was a farmhouse close by, but no fences or signs posted. And the third one was hunting in an area that was un unfenced. And there were signs posted on the property, but he was able, unable to read them from the road. The question is, all of these three areas are private land. 
the swamp, the farmhouse, the kind of looks abandoned, the field, can hunting occur on those territories? The court says no to where the farmhouse is. The court says no to where the fence is. The court says, yeah, probably to where the swamp is. In other words, the Indians have rights to be able to hunt, fish, trap on private land as long as there's not a visible incompatible use with their hunting, fishing, trapping rights. And it, it appears as though oh, the Indians would have understood using the canons of construction that if a, if a house was built, they shouldn't be shooting there. If a fence was put up, they shouldn't be shooting there. But in all other places, they can kill the beast. They, they can exercise that right. If there's no internal limit in the subtract of baby taken up, theoretically, what happens if one hunter took out of it? Good question. What if uh, you're in an area where all the land is taken up? That could amount to an extinguishment of the right without ever having to go back to the negotiating table. Now, the Mikasu Cree case, which I think we're going to come to at another point, says even in that point of taking up land for the purposes of settlement, mining, lumbering, trading, etc., there's a duty on the Crown to consult and accommodate the Aboriginal right to hunt, fish, and trap. The Crown tried to say in Mikasu Cree and other cases that we don't have to consult with the Indians about that because there it is in the document. We already said we can take it up. The court says, no, treaties are about reconciliation that's ongoing. It's not just at the time the treaty was entered into, but it's through every instance of time, including when the mining proposal comes forward, the rent, the timber, the other proposals come forward. Um, that's a short answer to that question. I'm sure there'll be more to say about that in uh, future classes. So we're at the end. We were able to talk about these th five issues, right? How do you interpret a treaty? I use the canons of construction. Who can uh, make a treaty? Who has the capacity? You look at that as the Indians naturally understand it. What rights are protected by the treaty in terms of scope and contact, content? We're considering visible, compatible use. The goal is reconciliation. Um, when Will courts consider a treaty right extinguished only if they're clear and plain intent? Silence does not extinguish a treaty right. Non-use in the government's term does not extinguish a treaty right. And how is a treaty reconciled with other interests? In this case, again, is it naturally would be understood by the Indians in accordance uh, with uh, uh, their, their views. So the next class, we'll pick up the uh, martial cases, the fishing cases, dealing with the um, peace and friendship treaties in the maritime. So thank you, have a great Thanksgiving, and don't come next week. Remember, no class Wednesday. We'll be meeting the following Monday.